Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, agritourism is a great way to bring people and money to rural areas. So what's the best way to get folks buzzing about your farm? We'll take you to one workshop and see if the tips there can work for you. We're taking in the sights and sounds at the Mississippi Nursery and Landscape Association Conference. See the new displays that were offered and hear how you can get involved. And if you're looking for a cool family activity, we've got you covered. In the Food Factor, you'll learn a safe way to make your own homemade ice cream to combat the summer heat. And speaking of scorching temperatures, we'll break down the numbers to see how crop yields are being impacted. What the experts are saying may surprise you. Farm Week starts right now. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week. You know, lucky for us, we're doing the show today, as we always do, from a nice air-conditioned studio. That's but right. with it being summertime, it's hot. A lot of folks talking about uh, vacations, too. And you know, Troy, sometimes it's good to think outside the box when you're trying to plan a vacation. That's true, because a lot of folks, you know, of course, they love the beach, the mountains. But you've got a story you're about to tell us about a different type, though. That's right. You might want to take your family and visit a local farm. It's called agritourism, and it's a bustling and growing new industry. It is a great way to see where some of your local food comes from and your dollars, how they're helping the local economy. Farm Week's Zach Ashmore spent some time at an agritourism workshop recently. He shows us how the people there learned some tips to get people buzzing about their farm. Agritourism is proving it can bring dollars and jobs to rural areas of Mississippi, but it takes marketing to make it happen. Growing your brand is how extension specialists and other speakers describe the task for farmers and landowners at this recent workshop. Betsy Rowell says she liked what she heard. And this is very interesting to uh, come and hear what some other rural communities are doing, uh, opportunities that we have to share um, our farms. And we do have some in Stone County that uh, we're looking to create a little bit of a, a tourism bud, uh, buzz with. Um, but this was very interesting. I met some folks that are probably a little bit beyond the, pro the point that we are in our process, so it was uh, quite beneficial. In addition to learning what others have accomplished, there were practical how-to sessions, including using social media, building effective websites, and creating virtual tours. It was practical information the operators could take home and put to use right away. I had come originally just to network and meet farmers and small growers and providers and small business owners in the state, and in turn I learned a lot about managing my nonprofit and, and things I can do to expand and grow and, and ways to use social media and, and reach out to other people. and kind of just increase that feeling of community we have here. Andy Lemon and others at the workshop were given a behind the scenes look at real life examples of local foods agritourism in South Mississippi. The group visited Country Girl Creamery, Redgate Bison Ranch, and Shroomdom. The owners at each location spoke about what they're doing right and what challenges they faced along the way. From Poplarville, Mississippi, I'm Zach Ashmore reporting. And you can stay up to date on programs like this by visiting our website, extension.msstate.edu. Just click on the Community tab. And you heard Zach mention the Redgate Bison Ranch in that story. Coming up here on Farm Week, our own Amy Taylor Myers will be visiting that ranch, so you'll want to watch for that story in the coming months. You know, it's hard to believe, but sometimes gardeners kill their plants with love in this week's Southern Gardening segment. Extension horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman trades in his shovel to play the role of crime scene investigator. In my role with MSU Extension as the Southern Gardener, I'm frequently asked to evaluate problems in the landscape. There are times when I consider myself part of the CSI horticulture unit. 
Some crimes against horticulture are very obvious, such as the highly publicized crepe murder spree that occurs unabated each spring. But another, more insidious crime against horticulture occurs without much media attention, burying our trees alive with mulch. This is a crime of passion because we love our trees so much. Proper mulching will reduce weeds, cool the soil, and conserve precious water in the tree's root zone. But no matter how many times I recommend to only use a two to three inch layer, many perpetrators insist that six to 10 inches has to be better. So the perps mulch and mulch and mulch. Oh, the botany. The problem is that a thick layer of mulch encourages decay, allowing pests, fungi, bacteria, and insects to get under the bark and cause problems internally for the tree. Circling roots are another problem, where the roots grow into the mulch instead of outward into the soil. The tree will not perform well in the landscape. Whether you use pine bark, shredded cypress, or pine straw, the proper way to mulch a tree is to spread an even two to three inch layer around the tree and pull the mulch back away from the tree trunk. Wherever there's crimes against horticulture, you can bet the Southern Gardener will be on the case. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. And you'll want to make sure you stay tuned to Farm Week during the month of August. Southern Gardening is celebrating its 20th year anniversary, and we'll be looking back at some of our favorite moments. Well, staying with the garden theme, the Mississippi Nursery and Landscape Association is devoted, of course, to offering its members educational opportunities and information about the latest retail products. At the recent MNLA conference, participants got just that. Many new varieties were on site during the conference tour of Mississippi State University's Trial Gardens. Plants like the new trailing begonia are tested the same as they would be in a typical backyard garden. Vendors were available to discuss other new plant materials and answer questions, while extension specialists covered insects, pests, and diseases. Well, extension has helped us for many, many years. They give us an opportunity to use their expertise. We have people that are specialists with our insect problems or our fungus problems or anything. We can come to them and, and, and get some information. And it's just a good mix of information and the availability, and they bring the information to us and so that we can use it and get it out to our members. The MSU Trial Gardens are located on North Farm at 60 Technology Boulevard in Starkville if you would like to visit. And one thing we can all agree on, it is hot. And one way to beat the heat and have a cool treat this summer is to chow down on a bowl of homemade ice cream. But when you're dealing with ingredients like milk and eggs, you need to know the proper steps to make this summer favorite taste good and not make anyone sick. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes shows us how to do just that. Whew. That's music to my ears. The humming sound of an ice cream churn is a welcome sound of summer. But each year, this cool treat causes many cases of salmonella. If your recipe calls for raw eggs, use pasteurized shell eggs or egg substitutes. Egg substitutes can be found in either the dairy case near the regular eggs or in the frozen food section. To make a cooked egg base, combine eggs and milk as indicated in your recipe. Other ingredients such as sugar and salt may be added. Cook the mixture gently to an internal temperature of 160 degrees, stirring constantly. The mixture will firmly coat a metal spoon. Even when using pasteurized eggs, start with a cooked custard base for optimum safety. After cooking, chill the mixture before adding other ingredients and freezing. If you are adding fruit to your ice cream base, remember to puree the fruit before adding it to make it easier to eat when frozen. By following the proper cooking practices, you can enjoy cold, yummy, homemade ice cream without making anyone sick. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. 
And one thing you'll need to remember, add rock salt to the ice when you're freezing the ice cream. That speeds up the process and lets you enjoy your ice cream sooner. The magical thing about food is the connection it brings. Connection to the farmer who produces it and connection to your family when you're enjoying a meal together. Amy Taylor Myers has a story now of how two brothers are using their business to connect two cultures that are an ocean away. On a cool North Carolina morning, 184 hogs are slowly loaded onto a truck. A combination of unique breeding and specialized diet has earned them a one-way trip to Japan. But the beginnings of this 8,000-mile journey took shape 40 years ago with a simple spreadsheet. We wrote software for indexing pigs. We would measure the economic traits like born alive, 21-day litter weight, um, growth rate, uh, we would measure back fat. The results of their testing led to a four-way crossbred hog that gained weight well while being calm in the hog house. The resulting meat stood out from lean hogs that were popular at the time. These hogs had a much higher fat content, which made the pork juicy on the plate. It caught the attention of Japanese wholesaler Sumi Tomo, who was looking to import pork with some specific characteristics not normally seen coming out of U.S. hog houses. They came into the plant and they saw the pork that were based on these genetics, the four-way cross, and they basically said, that pork works for us. Started out with a tractor trailer load of hogs a week. Bob and Ted now ship more than 12,000 metric tons of pork to Japan each year and have grown a hog operation to over 70,000 breeding sows. The Japanese consumer is much more discerning than the American consumer. While households here spend around 10% of their income on food, Japanese consumers spend more than 30%. The reason? A quest for quality and knowing as much as possible about the source of their food. It's so important that Sumitomo even places its own inspectors to help ensure the meat is being cut in the way Japanese buyers prefer. Japanese consumer wants to have super safe products. Whatever it is, they want to make sure that it was produced under a safe production procedure and also wants to purchase stuff that is traceable. Although pork is a traditional protein source in Japan, it has been secondary to seafood. But with the westernization of the Japanese diet, especially among younger consumers, tastes are changing. Learning the unique demands of Asian culture has been one of the leading challenges facing the brothers. And they've really taught us a lot on how to, how to make food better and safer and, and, and taste good. So they've been a great customer and, and they've really, it's been a, a good learning experience because we think that the same thing is happening now in the United States. We believe that the American consumer is adapting to the Japanese model. There are more and more people that want to know the story behind their food production. During production, the line moves at a much slower speed than conventional pork plants, allowing meat cutters to make more precise cuts and ensure the product always matches Sumitomo specifications. Each package is sealed individually, dunked into a cooling tank to remove any surplus heat, and inspected before boxing. The pork will remain at 34 degrees for the entire 17-day trip to Japan, delivered fresh to Sumitomo for slicing and delivery to retailers. One popular cut is the single-ribbed belly. American processors usually cure it for bacon. However, the Japanese consumer slices the belly for cooking. At plants like this one, the spare ribs are pulled out individually, leaving rib meat attached to the belly. The cut earns premium status in Japan and justifies the intense labor involved. The brothers also have plans to expand their reach by looking for markets closer to home. They're partnering with Sumitomo to bring their product to a growing audience of American consumers focused more on experience and quality than price. We, we think we've done that in Japan and we would love to do that here in the States. American consumer deserves it. I don't think they've gotten it yet. And if these pork brothers have their say, you could be seeing it on your table very soon. I'm Amy Taylor Myers reporting. Well, I've never been to Japan, but if ever go, I'll have to try some of that. Sounds pretty tasty. 
I know what else would hit the spot right now, though. Markets with Layton coming up right now. What do we got for today? Well, I haven't been to Japan either myself, but <laughs> we're going to start not with pork, but with chicken and several milestones related to our state's number one ag commodity. Also ahead this week in the markets, something is putting the brakes on herd expansion in the cattle sector. We'll discuss what this may mean. Cotton prices are up. It's time to sell some of the crop. And more foreign buyers are likely coming soon for U.S. corn. Well, we begin with a roundup of recent developments in the nation's chicken industry. First off, supplies are up. The government says there is 12% more chicken in cold storage around the country now than there was one year ago. On the foreign sales front, South Korea now says it will accept U.S. poultry again following a ban last year related to the outbreak of avian influenza. And the Campbell Soup Company says it is going to begin only using antibiotic-free chicken in its products. Campbell says that shift will take a few years to implement. Moving now to red meat, expansion of our nation's cattle herd may be slowing some, according to numbers released by the USDA on July 22nd. But that's not to say expansion is winding down completely. Extension economist Brian Williams explains what's going on now and what may be coming down the chute. Was the recent cattle on feed report basically in line with what the market was expecting? Well, part of it was and part of it wasn't. Uh, when we run through the numbers, uh, the, the total, cat, total number of cattle marketed in the month of June uh, was up about 9.4 percent. That was pretty close to expected. And then the total cattle on feed uh, was up about 1.2 percent, which was, again, you know, fairly close to where, where we were expecting. But the number that was off a little bit was our placements. And it was up uh, only about 2.9%, but we were expecting it to be up just over 6%. So it wasn't, the placements weren't near as high as what we were expecting. So it sounds like we may be looking at bigger numbers down the line as well as right now. Right. So we, we've got bigger numbers right now, but not quite as biz, big as expected. But I think what's coming into play here is the, the pasture conditions nationally are you know, fairly fairly good. Uh, so probably what we're seeing is more calves are staying on the grass for a little bit longer, and they're going to be coming down the pipeline in the future, which will bring those bigger placement numbers in the, in the next couple of months. So with bigger numbers to improve the market, we need more demand, right? Right. And demand has been holding fairly strong lately. Uh, when we look at those large uh, marketing numbers, uh, pushing up on double-digit marketing numbers, and even with those high numbers, we're not seeing the, the markets get hit that bad. So that's kind of a sign that, that we have some fairly strong demand. And I'm sure there's no statistics on this, but with this kind of hot weather, not only in the southeast, but in many, many parts of the country, this would seem to impact the, the grilling season somewhat. People may say, well, it's too hot to grill. Right. And it could, at least temporarily. I think in the long term, it probably won't. Uh, this is, I think, kind of a similar situation to what we see in the winter time when we have those snowstorms where it keeps people from getting out and getting to the store. Mm -hmm. Well, this warm weather might keep them from grilling right now, but, you know, when it cools down, I think they'll get right back out there. And how is our situation as far as uh, beef exports, export sales? Well, the export numbers are, are looking fairly positive, especially going forward. Uh, compared to a year ago, our U.S. prices are a lot more favorable compared to some of our foreign competitors, such as Australia. So since our prices are looking better, that's kind of helping to boost our exports a bit. Today's trivia quiz is about cotton, and the question pertains to a beetle that used to devastate the cotton crop. Here is the quiz question. How many years has Mississippi been free of boll weevils? We'll have that answer coming up for you. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, recent cotton prices have got people talking. We'll tell you what caused the excitement. Plus, we're introducing a brand new weather segment on Farm Week. And with it being so hot, I'll break down the numbers to see how the heat is affecting crop yields. The USDA August projections may surprise you. Stay with us. Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. Four eight. 
making the best better. Now it's the time when we shine the light on the families, farmers, and leaders that make the Mississippi State University Extension one of the nation's best. Here's your Extension Spotlight. Rice. It's what you eat when you want thousands of something. About 60 people definitely got their fill at the Rice Field Day in Stoneville this month. It was hosted by the Mississippi State University Delta Research and Extension Center. Topics included new developments in plant pathology, herbicide drift, and planting tips to increase yields. Attendees learned rice acres in Mississippi are up this year, and planting season was successful overall. Visitors also took part in the Mississippi Farm Bureau Federation Rice Grower Policy Meeting. Speakers discussed how November elections could affect farmers, along with current MFBF policy and its role in protecting farmers' interests. And that's this week's Extension Spotlight. Some traders are saying there's been more excitement in the cotton market recently than there's been in about two years. Analyst John Roach says producers need to take advantage of the prices now. He describes the setup that created this new opportunity. We, we got the July supply demand reports uh, from the uh, carryover stocks that were coming into this year, the June estimate, to the July estimate for carryover stocks going out into next year, we lost about 10% of the U.S. or the total of the world stocks, uh, and and that changes the fundamentals a little bit, and it gave us a, certainly a big rally in the market. Took us right up into a sell signal. It's the only market I've got a sell signal in, and and we've been there for I think six days. So we're an active seller of cotton at these kind of price levels because in the final analysis we still have something over a hundred days worth of surplus expected in the United States and 10 months worth of surplus in the world. So we're not into tight supplies at all. We've had a great rally. Take advantage of it if you're a cotton producer. Meanwhile, in the U.S. corn sector, the general consensus is that the grain needs to see improved demand. That's because the market is likely to face another large production at the 2016 harvest. As analyst Dan Huber sees it, the U.S. may be positioned well to indeed pick up a lot more corn export business before long. You know, and honestly, I look at the corn market and I think moving ahead, we're probably even a little bit understated on some of the export numbers. Uh, yeah, we're battling higher dollars and things, but I mean, when you look around the world right now, we're seeing a nice increase in a pickup in, in demand from some key areas, China particularly. I mean, they've the last two months, they've imported record quantities of corn. We know there's issues in Brazil. They're probably going to be a buyer of corn this year. So right now, uh, yes, ultimately, you're going to have Ukraine and Eastern Europe with corn, but we're, we're kind of the only game in town. So it's a good position to be in at this point. Well, we're in position to wrap things up here in the markets with the trivia answer before we move along. And here it is. The correct choice this week is D. Mississippi has been bull weevil free for eight years now. Weather and agriculture, they go together like peanut butter and jelly, salt and pepper, milk and cookies. I'm sure there's some that aren't food related too, but I can't help it, I'm hungry. My point is, at Farm Week, we want to make sure we're giving you useful information from all sides. As a certified meteorologist, weather has always been more than just a hobby for me. So when we can, it's always fun to spend a few minutes talking about a particularly interesting topic. So let me switch gears from the anchor desk to the green wall. It's the Farm Week weather break, and we're talking about humidity, corn, and if another scorcher is in store. Within the last week, many parts of the country experienced temperatures in the 90s and 100s. It was dubbed a heat dome by some meteorologists. It's basically a stubborn ridge of high pressure, which is associated with sinking air in stable conditions. This was some of the hottest weather of the season, but due to some storms that moved in earlier this week, it didn't linger for too long. Regardless, when you factor in the humidity, the feels like temperature, can be well over 100 degrees. Did you know that crops on the farm can contribute to the sudden increase in humidity? 
One big culprit is the corn crop. Unlike many plants, corn will sweat during the day and at nighttime. Just stand in a cornfield and you can feel the increased humidity. Oh, okay, we're leaving. The corn also acts as an effective way to transport moisture from the ground into the atmosphere. And where's that moisture coming from? Just a 600,000 square mile body of water called the Gulf of Mexico. The moisture is then blown over urban areas and into the northern parts of the United States. In spite of the heat wave, the USDA says conditions for corn and soybeans are looking good. More moderate temperatures across the Corn Belt have many analysts believing the USDA will even raise yield estimates in its August 12th report. Even though short-term forecast models are showing a bit more relief, we're not out of the woods yet. Mid-August could see another unseasonably warm pattern begin to develop. So we're probably not quite done saying it's going to be another hot one. We'll see you next time on the Farm Week Weather Break. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show, but you'll want to make sure you tune in for next week. We've got a really interesting feature story that's planned for you. Wild hogs causing headaches across much of the country. We'll examine the problem and see what you can do to regain control of your land. Plus, are the numerous milk options at the grocery store making your head spin? We'll break it down and help you pick out the best kind of milk for your family. And any good gardener wants to keep comfortable in the summer, but what about yourself? We'll give you some tips to make sure you're in the, cool, the coolest gardener in the neighborhood. That's next time on Farm Week. And for the whole Farm Week crew, we'll see you next time right here on the show.